Hello and welcome to another TLDR Explains video on the topic of Scottish independence. You might be asking why we're doing another video on Scottish independence now, given that we've already done four videos on the topic. And the answer is that we're doing this video because Scottish independence truly looks more likely than ever. And that's not just the opinion of a middle of the lane YouTube channel, it's the opinion of Sir John Curtis, the UK's most respected pollster. So in this video, we'll discuss why the Union looks more divided than ever, and if independence is truly on the cards for Scotland. If you like this channel and want to see more of the stuff we create, then be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon. Not only are you helping us get ever closer to 400,000 subscribers, you're also making sure that you get updated every time we post. Also, if you didn't know, we have channels dedicated to US and EU news, so if you're interested in those, there's links to them in the description. In an interview with BBC Radio 4's World at One on Monday, renowned pollster Sir John Curtis said that there have been nine independent polls on Scottish independence so far in 2020, which on average put yes slightly ahead with 51 points to no's 49. This will be good news for the SNP, but it only gets better because the four most recent polls that have all been done during the coronavirus crisis on average put yes at about 52 or 53% according to Curtis. And the most recent poll conducted by panel base for the Sunday Times at the start of July put yes at 54%. To put those numbers in context, according to Curtis, support for independence was on average at 48% in 2019 and just 45 in 2018 making this the first time in Scottish polling history where Yes had a sustained lead over a significant time. So if the polls and the pollster are to be believed, Yes would win a second independence referendum if it were held today, and support is only climbing. In fact, when the Sunday Times published that panel-based poll, Curtis wrote an article for the paper which opens, Never before have the foundations of public support for the union looked so weak. Which begs the question, why is this? Why is support for the union at an all-time low? Well, that panel-based poll can give us some clues. As well as asking voters what they thought of independence, the poll asked voters what they thought of Johnson and Sturgeon's handling of the coronavirus crisis, and there was a massive gulf. Johnson's COVID approval rating came in at a measly negative 39, whereas Nicola Sturgeon's was a ridiculously high positive 60. In fact, polling from YouGov in April found that even Scottish Conservative voters thought that the SNP was handling the coronavirus crisis pretty well, with support at 70%. On the other hand, Scots are also the least likely to think that the UK government have handled the coronavirus crisis well. And remember, this polling was done in April, so approval ratings have probably fallen a fair bit since then. And it's not just the government, Scots aren't at all keen on Boris Johnson, or for that matter, the new leader of the Scottish Conservatives, Jack Carlaw. This YouGov polling from way back in January shows how unpopular both were before the coronavirus crisis, and given Scots' attitude to their government, they're likely even less popular now. So that's part of the reason. Scots trust Nicola Sturgeon more than Johnson, and think that she's handled the coronavirus crisis better than the Prime Minister. To this point, Sturgeon has been a bit more wary with the easing of lockdown. Scottish pubs opened a few days later than English pubs, masks have been mandatory in Scottish shops since July 10th, and Scotland left Spain off its list of airbridge countries. And probably at least in part because of this, Scotland's coronavirus numbers are better than England, at least in terms of excess deaths per capita. But this jump in support for independence is also partly because the coronavirus crisis has given Holyrood, the Scottish Assembly, an opportunity to exercise its devolved powers. In essence, it's given people a taste of independence in the form of active devolved government. And now, full-on proper independence doesn't seem all that far-fetched. And if those numbers didn't seem scary enough for unionists, there are two reasons why you might expect support for independence to increase yet further. Firstly, if the government ends up with a no-deal Brexit, or as they call it an Australian-style deal, which is looking ever more likely, we can expect the UK economy to suffer. Given that 62% of Scots voted to remain, they'll be especially annoyed about having to pay the price economically for something they didn't really ask for. Secondly, the UK government published a white paper on Thursday 16th of July about the so-called internal market, which is the market within the UK. 
The white paper states that the government intends to introduce legislation to make sure that once the transition period is over, there aren't any barriers to trade between UK nations. This is because once the transition period is over, devolved assemblies become responsible for agriculture, fisheries, food standards and environmental policy, things that were previously decided by the EU. This means that in theory there could be trade barriers between, say, Scotland and England, if England decided on lower food standards than Scotland. Back in October 2017, the devolved assemblies realised that this could be an issue, and agree to develop a common framework to mitigate internal friction, which would be consented to by all the devolved assemblies. The government has now changed their mind though, and decided to use primary legislation, which can be passed without the consent of devolved assemblies. All it needs is a majority of Conservative MPs in Parliament. The white paper is also conspicuously vague about how the internal market challenges would be dealt with. It only says that the government will build on precedent to ensure that we continue to have the most effective mechanisms to deliver that objective. The objective being preserving the integrity of the UK internal market. Both the Scottish and Welsh devolved assemblies have already complained, so if devolved assemblies were overruled by some sort of internal markets bill, this would constitute a violation of the Sewell Convention, which prohibits the UK Parliament from legislating with regard to devolved matters without the consent of devolved legislatures. Again, this could increase support for independence if it's seen by Scots as the UK weakening Scottish devolution. On a lighter note, the white paper is entertainingly ironic. Who would have thought there were such advantages to being in a single market with free movement of people? Anyway, government doublethink aside, some of you listening might think that we're being silly. It doesn't matter what polls are saying, because Johnson is never going to grant another independence referendum. In fact, he said exactly this during the election campaign last year. And on his trip to Scotland on Thursday, he said that even if the SNP won a considerable victory in the Scottish elections coming up in May 2021, he wouldn't grant a referendum. At the moment, this is a tenable position to hold. They're just polls after all. However, if the SNP run on an independence platform in the election, it will sort of become a de facto referendum. If the SNP win an outright majority, both in terms of MSPs and vote share, it will be conclusive proof that Scots really do want independence, which will be politically difficult for Johnson to ignore. It will be even more impressive if they win an outright majority in terms of MSPs, because the Scottish electoral system, called additional member system, is designed to make it hard to win a majority. Basically, you get two votes, one for your constituency MSP and one for a second tier of non-geographical MSPs, known as additional members. There are 73 constituency MSPs and 56 additional members, for a total of 129 members, which means that you need 65 for a majority. The 73 constituency MSPs are elected using first-past-the-post, like in the UK, but the 56 additional members are assigned using something called the DeHomp method, which, in practice, means that they're allocated to make the results more proportional. To illustrate the difference, in the 2019 general election, which only uses first-past-the-post, the SNP won 48 of the 59 available seats in Scotland, with only 45% of the vote. In the 2016 Scottish Assembly elections, using AMS, the SNP only won 63 of the 129 available, with a similar percentage of overall vote. Anyway, the point is that if the SNPs win a majority of MSPs under an electoral system specifically designed to negate majorities, it will be hard for Johnson to ignore. Anyway, as a final footnote for this video, the Russia report which came out earlier this week, and we discussed in another video, stated that there is credible open source commentary suggesting that Russia undertook influence campaigns in relation to the Scottish independence referendum in 2014. Basically, Russia tried to influence the 2014 referendum to help the Yes campaign. Why would Russia want an independent Scotland? Well, obviously independent would likely hurt the UK politically and economically, but from a Russian perspective, perhaps the most salient effect of independence would be on the UK's nuclear capabilities. This is because at the moment, Trident, the UK's nuclear weapon system, is based at HM Naval Base Clyde, which is on the west coast of Scotland. Scottish ministers have previously said that an independent Scotland would force Trident to relocate, and it's not entirely clear where it would go. This is another topic entirely, but the long and short of it is that there aren't any other viable sites in the UK. 
and it could force Trident to be relocated to France or even the United States. It's the same reason that Iran meddled in the 2014 referendum, by pushing nationalist messages via proxy accounts on Facebook. Independence could seriously undermine the UK's status as a nuclear power. What do you think though? Do you think that Scottish independence is on the horizon, or do you think that we should be working harder to try and protect the Union? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And as always, you can also get involved in the conversation over on our Discord server. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified every time we release a video. Special thanks to our Patreon backers, who make videos like this one possible. And if you want to support us and see your name at the end of the videos just like these people, then be sure to back us on Patreon. There's a link to that in the description.